I've been involved with this foundation uh, for one reason, and that is Norman Borlaug. And many of you maybe have never heard of him. And if you have not, hopefully after today, uh, you can um, go online. There's documentaries. We have our website that you can go to and check it out uh, and find out who this uh, amazing Norwegian uh, uh hero to, of mine. So I, I hope you will uh, accept that I am Irish German uh, and Catholic, uh, but my hero is Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug was, uh, he, his family immigrated to America in the eight, late 1840s and came to settle in Wisconsin first and then made their way west as uh, all the immigrants did uh, it, during that time period. They ended up uh, eventually uh, in a little town outside of a little town called Saudi, Iowa, which was a uh, Norwegian community. And the, the Norwegian community, of course, uh, that, that's the way things were set up in Iowa when the, when the immigrants came. They would settle in these pockets where their cultures and language were similar. And so uh, like in Decorah, which is 20 miles away from Cresco, where Norman went to school, that is a Norwegian community. And then where I'm from in Cresco, it's more a, a German uh, Irish mix. And so uh, Norman's family settled where their relatives were. And that was uh, outside of Saudi, this little community, um, you know, about 25 miles from Decorah where the Westerheim Museum is. Um, an agricultural scientist that just happened to grow up in Northeast Iowa where I was a teacher uh, would later go on to be uh, termed the father of the Green Revolution, and he was uh, also titled the forgotten benefactor of, of uh, humanity for uh, the work that he did around the world. Um, and it just happens to be that this man got his start on the farms that we, we take care of uh, as a foundation. And uh, so Norman grew up in Northeast Iowa, but his ancestors came from uh, the I don't know how you pronounce the uh, the fjord, the the large fjord that's uh, in Norway. The um, I, I wouldn't know how to pronounce it, but his uh, his ancestors came over and uh, it ended up in Northeast Iowa. So uh, I'm going to just go on and uh, show you some pictures and uh, kind of narrate to his early life uh, in Cresco and outside of Cresco. So this was a farm um, that was in the northeast corner of the state and it was probably five miles away from any other town. Uh, this is a, a green, very grainy picture of his grandparents' house that they moved uh, into in the late 1800s. Uh, Norman was born in 1914 and they would add on to that farm later on, but this was just like a 15 by 16 foot little house that had a, a, an upper story that they could get to by ladder. So this is uh, uh, his grandfather and grandmother, that's Nels and Emma. Uh, they, uh, Nels was a young boy uh, that uh, when he, they immigrated and then his, his father is the one that's standing, uh, his name is Henry. And so they had three children in their family. This is uh, the, 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 the same building now, nowadays that we have. Uh, the, you can see there's additions that were put on. The two-story part that you see there with the windows, uh, Norm was born in an upstairs bedroom there in that farm site. And we call this the birthplace uh, farm site. Here's a picture of Norman. He was probably about 10, I would imagine. Uh, he's the one on the left, the shorter of the two. That's his cousin Vilmer that uh, lived down the road about a half a mile. Uh, in the days of uh, when he was born in 1914 and then living on these farms, you have to take yourself back. There was, uh, cars were around, but they were very uh, uh, few and far between. It was the days uh, of farming with horses and uh, getting to towns that are maybe as far away as Cresco, which was 14 miles, they would only go to Cresco to get uh, you know, some major supplies that they would need for the rest of the year. They were pretty much stuck on that farm. They didn't go places. They would go to the Saudi, uh, the little community of Saudi that had the Lutheran church. 
uh, where they could go to, to uh, church on Sundays. And then they had a, a general store there too and a blacksmith shop. But they pretty much stayed on that farm year round until they needed some supplies. And Henry, Henry might go to Cresco to get that a couple times a year or so. This is his, uh, they, they had three children. Uh, well, they had an, actually a fourth one that uh, died uh, at birth. But Norman was the oldest, and then he had two sisters, Palma, who's standing. Uh, she was born on Palm Sunday, and so they named her Palma. And then Charlotte was the youngest of the, uh, the three, and she was about five years younger than Norm. She would be a housewife that would end up growing up uh, and uh, being a farm wife and raising kids, and then also substitute teach, too. Uh, Palma, the, the uh, in-between, age one, she was a longtime uh, kindergarten teacher uh, nearby. This is uh, today's pictures of uh, Norm's boyhood farm that they moved to. You know, after that, uh, those three kids were born, it was getting pretty crowded. They were living with their grandparents in a little small house uh, at the birthplace. So you had uh, Nels and Emma, and then uh, Henry and his new wife, uh, Clara. And then they had their three children. And by that time, it was time to get it, to spread their wings and get their own place. So they bought this little acreage, uh, 56 acres, um, just down the road from uh, the birthplace farm. So we have now, we have both of these farm sites that are uh, we own that Norman Borlaug uh, gifted to us. And he, he started our foundation. Uh, we have the one-room schoolhouse that Norman went to school in. Uh, this would have been um, uh, built in 1865. So when uh, I tell kids that come to this uh, farm site to see where Norman Borlaug was from, uh, I can say what was going on in 1865. And that uh, when, this, when this building was built, uh, the, the builders were probably talking about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. So when Norm went to school here uh, in 1922 or 1921, it was already 55 years old or, or older. So this, this building uh, got so old to the point where they actually uh, built a new one room schoolhouse on the same site. And it was, it was um, sold and taken into the town of Protovan, which is a Czech community five miles away. And uh, that, uh, would then be brought back to the farm site after we found out uh, that it was in town. And so in about 1990, that was brought back there. Just a little information about uh, the one room schoolhouses. I'm sure you're all familiar with one room schoolhouses, but um, in Iowa, there was uh, at one time, probably about the time that Norm would have been uh, going there, there was uh, over 13,000 one room schoolhouses. They had to be about two miles apart because the kids walked uh, and so this, this school was actually about a mile up the road um, from the, this farm site. And uh, so the kids would walk to school every day. And it, in the book uh, on uh, Borlaug written by Noel Wiedmeyer, he tells about how uh, Norm tells the story how he almost died in a blizzard one day uh, when a storm hit. And so hopefully uh, it won't be anything like that in Washington, DC tonight. This is the inside of the school. Uh, we've made some improvements. These pictures are all a few years old. I did a presentation down here in uh, Green Valley, Arizona, a few years ago to um, uh, a full house that, uh, and I had this PowerPoint from that day. So I thought this would just, this has worked well with you guys. Uh, this is the inside of the barn at the birthplace. And this is some of his relatives that I'll tell you more about as we go on. Um, the, the lady in the middle is Jeannie. That is his daughter. Uh, she is living currently in the Dallas, Texas area. Her brother, Bill, is her other sibling, and he also lives in the Dallas area. Uh, Norm would end up retiring, uh, kind of semi-retiring, and becoming uh, you know, a visiting professor, speaker uh, for Texas A&M. And so Jeannie and Bill, their two kids are both living there and then all the extended family. And that little boy there, that is um, Luke. He is the, her grandson. And so Luke is the great grandson of Norman Borlaug. And the one year that they came back, 
uh, Jeannie and Luke came back to uh, our one of our Inspire Days, which are these educational programs we put on for fifth graders. They brought back uh, the historic medals that uh, Norman Borlaug won. Uh, the one, uh, I can't remember which one's the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, I think Luke is holding. And uh, then there's also the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal. Now, I think Luke's holding the Congressional Gold Medal. And so those are three of them. There's the National Academy of Sciences too, but these medals, uh, those three medals have only been given to a handful of people in the history of those medals. Uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, uh, Mother Teresa, Elie Wiesel, uh, and Norman was the fifth of those. And that, there's been a couple since then. So pretty select company. And, and yet uh, in our own state of Iowa, in our own communities, uh, there's so many people that don't know anything about this great man. It was, uh, you know, the forgotten benefactor of, of humankind for what he's did, which I would be telling you that in just a, a few minutes. That's his cousin, Alan, on the right, and then his great or grand nephew uh, on the left, Bill Reed, who um, uh, is on our board right now. Here's uh, the other thing that uh, the state of Iowa um, did here as of 2014, there's a statue behind there for Iowa. And you see that that is um, Norman's statue of him in a wheat field. And he's taking copious notes on the, the wheat varieties and there's wheat behind him. So these are some of my foundation members that uh, are on our board. We have about 20 right now. Um, so his statue was unveiled on March 25th of 1914, his 100th birthday. And uh, that was quite an event. I was able to be there. Actually, I was there with a school group touring uh, DC at the time. And I got uh, the opportunity to get some time off to go watch the, uh, the ceremony uh, of the unveiling of that statue. And I'm sure many of you living out in that area have been to the statuary hall where that is. Um, and uh, it's really a special place now for us knowing that uh, Norman Borlaug statue is there. You know, that has to pass, the, the, the state legislature has to uh, agree to do that. And so they passed a unanimous uh, uh, resolution to have his statue put there. So not too many, times and um, that we get unanimous decisions anymore in our politics. Um, so Norman, uh, he went through uh, eighth grade in that one room schoolhouse. His uh, cousin Sina, who was his teacher in seventh and eighth grade at that one room schoolhouse encouraged his parents to send him on to high school because he, he had a lot of grit and determination. And family said that he always had a fascination with plants and how they worked. Uh, so he went to the uh, Cres Cresco High School and then would graduate and then was encouraged by uh, family members to continue his education. And uh, he was set to go to what we now call UNI in Iowa, uh, University of Northern Iowa, which is a teacher school. All set to go there, but uh, there was a guy that was from Cresco that had come down to uh, try to convince him that maybe he should go to the University of Minnesota because he could play football there. You know, he's a good athlete. He wrestled, but he wasn't a very big guy. And that was back in the days when the University of Minnesota had, uh, you know, they'd won a national championship and would go on to win another one. So he ended up changing his mind and went to uh, the University of Minnesota where he failed the entrance exam. So he ended up going to what it was like the new, a uh, new college of, uh, it was like a junior college to get your credits up to where you could make it into university. And so here he was, this man that ends up uh, changing the world, and he uh, um, failed to get into, into the University of Minnesota. So he wrestled at the University of Minnesota. He wrestled uh, in, in high school also. Uh, and he said he got a lot of lessons of toughness, determination, uh, perseverance, all those things that uh, he used in the wheat fields in uh, Mexico that I'll tell you more about. Um, he got that in the wrestling match and he, he felt that that really uh, gave him a lot of uh, inner drive. This is him at uh, the University of Minnesota and he would later meet uh, Margaret who would, uh, they would marry. Uh, they both worked in a coffee shop near uh, downtown uh, where the university is. And they, in those days, this is during the Great Depression in the 30s, 
um, they had to work for to just to make sure that they could eat. And he saw in the University of Minnesota, he you, he walked downtown and he saw the soup kitchens and, and the long lines of people waiting for food. And he was really struck by that because they always had enough food on the farm, but this is a little different. So here's their picture of their wedding day. That's Margaret and Norm. Margaret would become quite a woman herself in that she had to, uh, while this man was out doing what the work that he did, uh, she was holding down the fort with her two kids and living in Mexico City. Uh, so Norm would, uh, would uh, get his undergraduate degree in forestry. He always loved trees. And, and um, so then he went to work. Uh, he had a job lined up after he graduated with the forestry degree with uh, the Forest Service. Uh, either he was going to go to Idaho, where he had been before, or to Massachusetts, but the job fell through because of uh, the depression. And so then he had, uh, what, what am I gonna do? He said to Margaret and decided to go back to school. And there he, uh, he went to a class on plant pathology taught by uh, Elwood uh, Stakeman, this, uh, this uh, professor that was so well thought of across the United States for his, his uh, work in agriculture. So he went back to school uh, and uh, would then get his PhD in plant pathology and genetics and would go to work during uh, the World War II um, with the DuPont company, uh, making, uh, working on different kinds of uh, applications on what you could do to help the, the cause of, of, of the soldiers. And one of the things I think he was working on was like a, a glue that would be able to not um, let go, like the, the glue on the boxes of the, the um, rations that they were sending to the soldiers, they'd have to, you know, uh, it was, it was uh, salt water was around them all the time. And the salt would break down the, the glue. So he was working on that. But so he did his, uh, his stint in, um, with the DuPont company during World War II and it would eventually, uh, agreed to go uh, as part of a, a, a team of agricultural scientists with, that was set up through the Rockefeller Foundation, the Mexican government, to work with um, uh, the Mexican people to help grow more food. Their, their, their farming practices were um, very poor. They, they farmed the same way for uh, a long period of time for generations and generations. So here's the group of scientists that went down there uh, and Norm was put in charge of wheat, which he had never grown wheat. And in Iowa, uh, when he was a child helping Henry out in the farm with uh, the horses, they grew everything that uh, you would need to sustain yourselves on that farm. And that would be oats for the horses and the pigs and cattle. And then, uh, you know, basically hay and corn. That was the three things that they grew uh, on the farm at those day, those times. Never had he worked with wheat. Uh, these people would all go on to their own successes, but uh, Norm seemed be, to be the one that was taking um, the bull by the horns more than anybody else. So here's looks like a, this is an old dilapidated research facility that they had. Uh, he went, he was sent down to near Mexico City Chapango is this uh, area in the highlands uh, outside of Mexico City, up about uh, 6,700 feet or so, from what I understand. And uh, they were just starting from scratch, uh, trying to try to better the farming practices down there. And he was put in charge of wheat. And so here he is. Uh, this is probably years later after uh, he was having some success. So, so let me just tell you a little bit about what he was uh, working on. Wheat is a, and I've got some of it here. This is, uh, this is our Ulenek that we grow. It's a Norwegian uh, uh, folk tale. But anyhow, this, this uh, the wheat that they had grown down in Mexico for all of those hundreds and hundreds of years it just, it was a mess and they were not able to have enough food for their own people. And so he uh, was put in charge to try to 
increase the production of that. There were some problems with it. Uh, you had uh, the wheat that uh, um, was susceptible to the disease of rust, which is a fungus that uh, comes on the, the, uh, the, the air streams in, in the summertime. And it gets on the stems of the, the wheat plant and it will rot the, the wheat. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the process, processes he did was through crossbreeding of wheat, and that's what the picture is showing you, um, he's having to try to breed out of that, that wheat, the disease of rust in there. And that was one of the, the, the many things that he did with it. Now rust had been around since the days of Jesus 2000 years ago in the mid, uh, all across the world. And uh, he worked on this for a period of about 15 years before he was able to completely eradicate uh, the disease from the wheat crop. And uh, these seeds were um, resistant to it. And what he did is it's basically you're taking uh, two different varieties of wheat that you want to have the characteristics uh, of one of them come through. And maybe this one plant is resistant to the rust where the, the other one has bigger heads. And so he would do the crossbreedings of that. He did this uh, tens of thousands of times in the fields and the, he would do this, uh, he'd be out there working with uh, the other scientists. There was teams of young scientists that were working with him. Um, so rust was one of the things. And then of course, uh, the growing season uh, was only one season. And then he heard of another area up in Northern Mexico, uh, about seven or 800 miles to the North that is at sea level instead of being in the mountains. And it was another, it was an abandoned research facility and uh, owned by the, uh, the United States government or the Mexican government. And so he asked permission to the Rockefeller Foundation to go up to that other location where he could actually grow a whole nother um, crop up there. And uh, they begrudgingly let him do that. And he, he took the best seeds that he was developing uh, near Mexico City and would take that uh, to the northern uh, Yaqui Valley, which was at sea level, and he would plant the seeds there. Well, scientists in those days said, you can't, you can't grow um, uh, the same wheat in different locations because uh, it needs the, the differences of the, uh, the light, uh, the photo or the photo periodism it's called. It's a uh, different sunlight uh, variations and so it wouldn't work. Well, what he did was he, over the seasons, he did this back and forth. He would take his best seeds from Mexico City up to the, to the Yaqui Valley and plant those seeds there. And then back and forth, he would take the best seeds from both. And he built into this wheat, the ability to grow at different uh, uh, sunlight amounts, uh, to different uh, climate conditions, to the highlands, to uh, sea level. Uh, and then through the crossbreeding techniques, he was able to get the heads to grow much larger um, and then be resistant to the disease of rust. One of the problems was he, he encouraged the Mexicans, you have to fertilize more. You know, you, you're just not, you know, you're not getting the most out of your soil and the soil was depleted. And then what, what happened with him fertilizing and these research uh, plots is the, the wheat was growing tall and this wheat um, would then fall over in the summertime through the winds and the, the, the rains that they would get. And it would, it's called lodging and that it makes it very difficult, uh, if not impossible to harvest it. And so what he did is he got some seeds from uh, another scientist from uh, that brought some seeds back from uh, Japan. And uh, these were dwarf wheat seeds that he was able to uh, crossbreed along with the ones that were resistant to rust and the ones that had larger heads on them. And eventually he got that wheat that was growing too high and, it, and the fertilizer had caused the growing to happen too much that where it would lodge. He grew that wheat to it's about half of its uh, size. Um, and uh, and made it so that it wouldn't fall over. Here's a uh, rust on the stems of some wheat. You can see that, not a very good picture. And then of course, here's the, uh, if you can see that yellow, 
uh, Mexico City is down here at the bottom, and then the other place is the, the Sonora Valley uh, and Yaqui Valley that's uh, way up north. It's only 300 miles from where I'm living right here in, in uh, south of Tucson. So here's the wheat that used to grow tall, and there's Norm out in the wheat field. Uh, and this is the lodging that happened with the blowing over of the, the winds from all the fertilizers that he was using. He was getting it to grow very healthy, but then this new problem cropped up. So then uh, these teams of scientists that he would bring from all over the world uh, in Mexico too, uh, to try to uh, solve this problem and grow more wheat, uh, he would end up uh, getting it to grow much shorter. There's Henry Wallace, who was vice president under uh, FDR back. This was taken uh, probably about 44, 45 or so. Uh, he went there in 1944 and and of course, Henry Wallace was the vice president then. So here's this iconic picture of Norman Borlaug in the wheat field. He, he had these research books. So he would write down the, every detail of each crossbreeding that he did with these different varieties and the characteristics where it's resistant to, to rust or it's not resistant to rust or it's growing this height or the, the seeds and, uh, are too small or whatever. He kept copious notes. There's dozens and dozens of these books that are at the University of Minnesota archives that show all the meticulous work he did. Now, this is the, uh, the photo periodism that adapts the, the, the length of the day that he bred into this wheat so that uh, it could grow uh, in different sunlight in different locations. So here's this team of scientists that he brought that are from Mexico and he's teaching them the crossbreeding techniques. Basically you can see the, uh, the heads, what they do is they have to cover that up with a paper and they demasculate them and cover them up until they're ready to be uh, bred with another variety. And then they bring this variety with the, uh, the pollen that is coming out. And then they open that little paper sack up and pour that into where the demasculated um, uh, head was, and then that would grow a new variety. I wish I could better explain that. I'm not a scientist. Uh, so this, one of the things that Norman Borlaug was uh, so adept at, it was seeing that he could uh, teach this to people from around the world. And so he started having success in Mexico in the mid fifties. Um, you know, this was about a 10 year process before they really had some breakthroughs. And then he would bring people from around the United States and Mexico, Canada, but also from other places around the world, including uh, the Middle East. Uh, you know, you had Iran, you had Iraq, uh, Turkey, um, Afghanistan, all those countries that are uh, in that same area. And they would, he would teach them, he says, uh, you're going to be taught to be rebels, but not with guns, but with uh, with these seeds, these miracle seeds. There's, um, and then uh, of course there was a book that came out by uh, Paul Ehrlich that uh, said that uh, starvation is going to happen around the world. We can't, we aren't, we've got po the population is growing crazy and we have nothing we can do to help uh, these starving nations. And so India and Pakistan were faced with um, uh, mass famine in the uh, 60s, in the early to mid 60s. And now Borlaug had had his breakthroughs with this wheat. He got rid of the disease of rust. And this is the incredible thing. Something that had been around the world for 2000 years or more. Uh, he had completely eradicated this through this, these seeds that he developed, these super seeds. And now he was ready. They, they went from Mexico being uh, not able to grow enough food for their own um, country and their people, that now they were able to export uh, this, uh, uh, this grain. And this grain, he now would take to uh, India and Pakistan and try to convince their world leaders, but also the scientists there and the farmers too, that uh, we have perfected this wheat, we've gotten rid of the disease of rust. If you plant this wheat in your, your research facilities, you will have the success that it takes to uh, and you will have bountiful crops just like uh, we have in Mexico. They said that you can't do that. You can't 
you can't grow wheat in this location where you it's a completely different location different climate and he says it will grow and so they uh the scientists uh finally agreed to try some and then a few of the farmers did and norman said what it took us 15 years to develop in mexico to have the success where they doubled and then tripled how much uh, grain was being grown there he says it will take you just three years and uh, he was a true visionary uh, he convinced that uh, this is the leader uh, in uh, Pakistan, and uh, he convinced uh, the scientists in India and Pakistan. Here he is with uh, Indira Gandhi, uh, where, you know, if you do this, you're going to have a bountiful crop. And three years later, sure enough, they did. He also warned them, he says, you better build some um, storage facilities for this grain. You're going to have so much you won't have a place to store it. They're, they had no storage. Uh, they just went from season to season. Uh, and of course, that they didn't do the, the storage. And three years later, they had a bountiful crop and they had to close the schools to store the grain there. This shows a uh, uh, Borlaug with uh, the wheat that was packaged and ready to be sent to, to Pakistan and India. This is in uh, 1965. Uh, uh, those that are old enough will remember the Watts riots of 1965. Norman uh, got this wheat that was going to be sent uh, from Los Angeles, and it just happens to be the trucks were moving this grain right through the middle of Los Angeles to the port during the Watts riot. So there was all kinds of uh, uh, drama to this. But uh, here's the trucks as they're going from Mexico to uh, the port in Los Angeles and they did get off. And of course, then they went over to Indian Pakistan where they were nearly at war too, um, but they did. They had the success just like Borlaug said. So here's the cargo hold and here they are planting the wheat. Now that wheat is only growing about as high as your hip instead of growing uh, shoulder high. And then uh, much more energy goes into the, 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 uh, the head of the, the seeds and uh, the seeds, or the heads are much larger. And here he is, a picture in 1969. So now after his success in Mexico and he's brought these scientists from around the world and he, he sends seed home with them to their, their home countries and giving them instructions on how to do this. Uh, and now having a success in India and Pakistan where they were expecting uh, millions to die of starvation in the next few years. He's, he completely alleviated that and they had a bumper crop to the point where they no longer had uh, famine and it saved their countries. And because of that, uh, in late 1969, the uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, Committee uh, gave Norman Borlaug the, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize for his work for not as an agricultural scientist, because that was not uh, something that was spelled out to the, um, um, in the committee for uh, Alfred Nobel after he died, that was not in his will, but uh, he received it because of his humanitarian work bringing uh, food to a starving world. And um, here's a picture of him probably a year after he received the Nobel Prize. The day that he got it, uh, Margaret came out to the fields. He was there. He'd always be there from early in the morning till late at night. He was there with those scientists working. Um, some of these young scientists are now older and they're, they're around prestigious universities, some in the United States. Uh, Ronnie Kaufman that's at uh, Cornell, I believe it is out east, um, was his, uh, worked in the wheat fields the day that he got that uh, prestigious award. So Margaret told him, you won the Nobel Prize. And he says, ah, well, I got too much work to do. They, they, she says, this, the, uh, there's reporters who want to talk to you. But he kept on working until the reporters came to him out in the fields. He didn't care about uh, that notoriety. He just, he was flabbergasted. So this is uh, the day of the ceremony that took place in December and uh, 1970. Here he is getting, shaking the hand and his speech that he gave. And in that speech, he made sure to uh, let everybody know that, you know, we're just 
this is a war. We, we've, we've won this battle, but there's still a long way to go. The major thing that we have to look at is the population problem. You know, when, he, when Norman was born, I think I've got some slides of that coming up. Uh, there was only 1.6 billion living on the earth. And when he died, there was 6.6 uh, uh, .6 billion. So in one on. lifetime, there were 5 billion I'm more not, people. I'm not on video. Or they don't have my. I'll stop there a second. Okay. Um, so there they are, uh, Margaret and Norm. And there's the Nobel Prize that was brought to our farm. So here's the population growth. Uh, in 1914, when he was born, there was 1.6. And now there are... Uh, well, when he died in, in 2009, there was 6.6. .6, and now there we're up to about, I think it's 7.8 billion people living on the earth. It's supposed to peak in about uh, 2050 at uh, around between nine and 10 billion people. And so Norman was faced with this, you know, throughout his life. Uh, he saw famine. He saw hungry people during the Great Depression. Um, and he knew what could be done. And he put his mind to it and uh, worked his entire life uh, devoted to uh, growing as much food as possible uh, because of all these, these numbers. And obviously the population problem has not ended. Here's a little bit about his family. Here's his, uh, his um, wife, Margaret, with Jeannie when he was a teenager and, and Bill, who's a few years younger. Jeannie's probably 70 seven i would guess right now bill's probably 74 uh and they both live in the dallas area now one of the things about norm norm loved sports and um he was a very active man he loved baseball but they didn't have baseball in the high school team this is just a little town team that they would get together and they play they'd clear out a field out in a farmer's field and play baseball there and then the area town teams in cresco would play each other and he just loved baseball and one uh, reporter when he was an older man after he got the congressional gold medal in 2009 asked him so if you had it all to do over Dr. Borlaug would you do anything different he says yeah I would have played second base for the Chicago Cubs and that's because of um, uh, in the late 20s Henry his dad brought home from uh, Cresco radio an Atwater Kent radio that was a battery operated radio when he was a kid and they hooked up a little mini um, windmill at the top of the house and ran a cord down and in through a window and hooked that to the back of this batteries that where they could chart the uh, windmill would then charge those uh, the tube filled batteries that were liquid and they he could tune in to uh, listen to the Chicago Cubs on WGN radio so that uh, he became a real Cubs fan. And uh, uh, when he went to Mexico, you know, he was spending uh, so much time away from his family, you know, his half of the year, he was in the Northern part of the state, uh, you know, at the Yaqui Valley, instead of being near his family, which was in Mexico city. And so, he felt bad about this for, you know, he wasn't spending time with his son. He was gone so much that uh, he decided he and this uh, agricultural scientist that worked with him in corn, they worked on trying to develop a, a little league team for the kids in Mexico city. And especially for the, you know, the American kids that are down there with their uh, families that are living there. And so Norman and his friend started, uh, the first little league baseball in Mexico city. And I don't know if it existed around the rest of Mexico, but I just remember as about a 16 year old kid watching on the wide world of sports, the uh, uh, little league world series and Mexico was in it. And they won that, that, uh, that title that year. And Norm's teams would play some of those Mexican teams too. So he's directly responsible for getting Little League Baseball started down there. Here's another picture of his team and, and his son, Bill. And I'm not sure which one Bill is there. Here is uh, just showing him out in the wheat fields uh, in Mexico. 
So from this, you know, as things went on, so he had his success from 44 to 59 is where they had the breakthroughs. The early 60s, now they had uh, grown enough food to feed their, uh, their own people in Mexico. They were successful. Uh, they were now uh, able to export their grains, not just uh, wheat. They worked with rice. They worked with uh, maize and uh, sorghum. Oh, uh, a uh, then the, the, they set up an international maize and wheat improvement that's still there and is still the uh, main research facility in um, outside of uh, Mexico City, but also up in that Yaqui Valley where he had... Uh, also work there too. So they have, uh, this is one of the most uh, 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 the leading research facility. Uh, if you talk to farmers that are gonna grow wheat in, in uh, Kansas or wherever it happens to be in the United States, more than likely they're going through this uh, CIMIT organization to be able to um, uh, get their, their wheat from there. So he worked with all kinds of, uh, of uh, important leaders. He didn't care about his fame or anything like that. Here he is with Nixon, here he is with uh, Bush. And then of course he would work with uh, Jimmy Carter uh, in Africa in the eighties. Uh, and this is uh, the beginnings of where he was contacted by Jimmy Carter uh, with, um, with the idea of trying to get a program started in Africa. He had been working in Asia and all around the world, South America, but Africa was a different animal. And this is something that uh, was a pretty daunting task, but he was approached by Jimmy Carter and uh, Royal Sasakawa, who was the uh, philanthropist that owned the Nippon company from Japan and encouraged uh, them or Norm to come and be the scientist that would be the uh, person that would lead that part of it. And so Carter uh, provided the, uh, the political clout to get into these, uh, these different countries. And um, Sasakawa from Japan would be the person that would do the funding of the money. And then Borlaug was the, the head of the scientific effort. And they would work with about a dozen countries in Africa until Norm's dying days. Now, Norm, after he received the Nobel Peace Prize, he, he was being sought after for speeches and kind of consulting with all sorts of uh, things. But uh, uh, he still uh, would travel the world all the way into his 90s. This is in 1985 when he was just getting started. Uh, but he would work, uh, he would travel way over, it was into his early 90s. Um, this just shows the, the change in um, uh, production of wheat and also corn and, and the other different cereal crops. Uh, in 1960, when he was having his breakthroughs, there was 692 million tons of uh, grain to now, you know, like in 2000, 20 years ago, they tripled that. And so the success, what he has done is he has... Um, he perfected the wheat to where it now is um, uh, all the wheat that was grown in the world was the, the seed that he developed in, in the wheat fields of Mexico and then dispersed through his team of scientists that he brought from around the world. And uh, from that, you know, they eradicated that disease of rust. They tripled how much grain was grown in the world. He, uh, and of course uh, was the, the head of all of this. And, and it was all because of those, that uh, determination that he had. Now he said that rust disease will come back. And at the end of uh, the in 1990s, right around 1999, there was, they found um, rust uh, coming back. I think it was Uganda. And uh, so now this shows like a, uh, the colored uh, map showing where they are trying to combat this new strain of rust, just like the, the variants of, with COVID. It's the same thing with this, uh, this shifty fungus that uh, morphs into something else that can be deadly. And so they're still working on that. He started the Global Rust Initiative in, in uh, 2000, 
uh, with the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they gave $25 billion to get it started. Um, this is just some pictures that shows him at the, when he was receiving the Congressional Gold Medal uh, with uh, President Bush and Pelosi and Harry Reid. And there he is with those prestigious awards. He received the Nobel Prize in 1970, the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom in 77 from uh, Gerald Ford. And then in 2007, he received the Congressional Gold Medal. And so he passed away in 2009 at the age of 95. He got cancer, um, he had leukemia, but he lived with that for about five years and still worked. I mean, here this man was in his 90s. Um, and one of the things that Jeannie said that uh, she was caring for him in his last days. And she, and she said that he called her to his bed and said, Jeannie, um, I got a problem. And Jeannie said, what's that, daddy? And, and he says, my mission in Africa is not done. So this man worked his whole life, but he thought of others. Um, his, um, the, the people that were those third world country people that, that would never know who he is. Uh, he was so concerned about them and, until his dying days. You know, you would think as you're laying there, you're thinking about your family, but he was thinking about the world even then. Quite a man. Here he is in the last year of it. He went down to uh, the CIMIT, the, uh, the research facility in Mexico that uh, began with his help. And of course, uh, he, you know, one of the things that he went to the Nobel Prize uh, people and um, suggested that they should have a, a Nobel Prize for agriculture, an agricultural scientist. And they said, well, it's not in no Alfred Nobel's uh, will, so we can't have that. And so he's, he decided to start the Nobel Prize for food production. And that's the World Food Prize that he started back in the mid 80s. Um, and so there's an award every year to uh, scientists or farmers or whoever it happens to be that have done something to help with the production of food uh, around the world. And uh, he started the Youth Institute, which is a part of the World Food Prize, where these young kids come from around the United States, but also from around the world. And they present a research project uh, based on uh, you know, a third world country. And then they, if they're chosen as one of the 20 or so, they are sent to all around the world to work with uh, scientists, uh, Borlaug scientists, uh, learning these things first, or, you know, hand in hand uh, for a whole summer and everything's paid for. And that was started by him. Here's some of my foundation members and some of the models of our homes that we, or the places that we have on the farm site. This picture is taken in Luther, Iowa, which is a, uh, or excuse me, Decorah, Iowa, which is Luther University where we are, uh, which is a Norwegian school. And um, they're called the Norse. Um, and so that's just some of our members. Here's the inside of a barn that we've done a lot of work to. It's since then, uh, it's kind of our new welcome center. It's all, it doesn't look like that anymore. It's much more developed than that. That's our foundation, along with Jeannie and, and Luke. We have uh, Inspire Day. Some of the things that I do is the educational programming is we have uh, a couple of Inspire Days where we bring people from Iowa State, uh, We've had uh, Luther College um, that all come and present to these fifth grade kids. And uh, it's, it has to do with the agriculture, it has to do with uh, science, it has to do with global issues. And we have these young people from Luther that do lessons with the kids. We have Iowa State, uh, the Dean and the Associate Dean have been there giving lessons. This gal is, uh, she's a, uh, doing an entomology lesson. She's got creepy bugs that the kids are looking at. Here's me talking about Borlaug in the one room schoolhouse. Uh, this is the associate dean from Iowa State that's, he travels to Africa several times a year and uh, develops or has programs there that's working with uh, the governments. There's an engineer from Iowa State. And then we have a food packaging event because Norman was so responsible for growing so much food for the world. And we want them to all think altruistic and, and uh, give back 
uh, to your world. And that's so we have these inspire days to try to teach kids that, you know, this is important that you have to do something for your fellow man. And we and I drum home to these these fifth graders that you're going to be taking over for us older people. And you're the ones that are going to be faced with these problems when there's nine billion people living on the earth and we only have that same amount of land. So that was always norm uh, um, motive was just to grow as much food as possible. So here they are just packaging some food. And so we bring high school groups out there. We, you know, this is, uh, I think this, this is the president of Iowa State on the left there. That's Wendy Winterstein. Uh, she used to come up and do entomology lessons with the kids. And here's Jeannie talking to the kids and showing them those medals. That was quite a day to be able to have uh, those children all got to hold those three prestigious medals. How many of you can say that you've seen those medals in person, let alone being able to hold them in your hand? She brought along white kid gloves, put them in a bag and she had them in her carry-on. You know, pretty important medals to be carrying the way that, that way. So here's the Luther, uh, uh, kids, they're, they're going to be uh, teaching, they're going to student teach in the fall. And so this is their final project is to do a Borlaug project that's, that is science related or global related math. It can be music for that matter. We have ag institutes and, and uh, uh, speakers that come in to talk about the, the latest in the agricultural uh, initiatives. Here's our barn that we worked on. Uh, the, it's at the birthplace, and this is the condition it was in before, and then it, what it looks like after. It's a lot different than that now, too. And here's this iconic house that they moved to. This is a Sears home that uh, was built in 1922. So the, the family, when they decided to move to this farm, they ordered in the Sears catalog, and it cost about $1,000, and it came in on the railroad, and they picked it up with their horse and wagons, and, and I assume the, the family all got together to build that. So that's on our farm site. It's beautiful, beautiful, serene place uh, out in the middle of, uh, you know, there's no city around. So for all of you that are living near Washington, D.C., it's a great place to go. Here's just somebody, you know, a day, a school day. And we have signs that go around arm uh, that connect the fields. Like right behind those signs there are the fields that Norman would have farmed when he was a kid growing up with horses. And then they, you know, he was able to go to high school because they got a tractor later on. Here are a couple of kids doing a National History Day project and I'm taking them around in the farm site and, the, and we've got a couple statues that have been donated by a doctor that was so taken with uh, Norman's story. So that's a Norman feeding chickens right in front of the chicken coop. And then there's a st statue of Norman working with wheat in the wheat fields of Mexico on a world um, statue. And here's our walking paths. We'd love to have you come out there sometime. If you ever get, you, you'll want to come, you Norwegian people will want to come to Northeast Iowa where Decorah, Iowa is the Vesterheim Museum, which is uh, one of the best Norwegian museums, I can't imagine a better one than that. Um, and then you can come to the Borlaug Farms 25 miles away and walk these serene paths. We have a prairie wetlands restoration, got some woods that you walk through. It's very tranquil. We have a great website. Uh, I'm gonna be ending pretty soon. I'll take questions or whatever, but it's at normanborlaug.org. I would suggest you check out our website. There's virtual tours that were developed by our interns that. Uh, uh, you know, you can see the farm sites and, and hear stories of Norm in the buildings, what he did on the farms. All of those things are virtual. You can check out at normanborlaug.org. Um, here's just the last scene. And so there's my, my email address and, and Bill can always send that on to you if you wanna, if you have something in particular that you wanna ask me or you want, want more information. Uh, and of course, I would suggest if you go on YouTube, and Bill talked about putting this on YouTube, um, if you just type in YouTube on your computer uh, and then type in uh, Norman Borlaug, this will come up, the Freedom from Famine, the Norman Borlaug story. It's about an hour long, and you'll get a, a real good uh, 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 look at Norm's life, uh, and it's about 60 minutes long. 
very worthwhile. Uh, Bill and I were talking about the, the uh, American Experience documentary that was on last year on Borlaug. You know, there was uh, one of the things about Borlaug is he was criticized because of his, his um, increasing of fertilizers and pesticides and things like that. But, you know, without getting into a, you know, a big discussion about that, it was all about his, his main um, push was to get as much food in the mouths of these starving people. He saw kids dying of starvation and he wasn't going to sit idly by while this was going on. And so he was going to do whatever it was. And when you see that population exploding so much that it's important that um, we got to find ways of growing more food. Um, so with that, Bill, I am uh, pretty much finished with uh, my presentation. I don't know if I took too long or if you've got some time, if, if people have questions. Well, Tom, Tom I, I think that was fascinating. fascinating. I, uh, it's wonderful that we have a Norwegian that uh, was able to accomplish so much and uh, in helping the world. Has he, since he was in Iowa, did, has he influenced also the agricultural in the Midwest? Um, well, no, it, it was, it, he was working in Mexico. And so he would uh, come back uh, and uh, go to universities and, and talk to uh, those, those people there. But it was, you know, every, everything was connected with him in, in Mexico City during those time periods. So no, he really, he would uh, travel and speak at the University of Minnesota, at Iowa State and all over United States for that matter and Canada uh, traveled the world but more as a after his success it was more as a consultant and an advisor and uh, you know uh, they used him as a person that could open doors uh, and so that's probably more than anything so he didn't really work with uh, uh, in the United States that much except you know maybe in his later years at Texas A&M a little bit. This is his book that's a compilation of three books. Uh, behind Bill is the three books that Noel Wittmeyer, who lives in Lorton, Virginia, not that far from some of you. He lives that, just a couple miles from uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, but he wrote, he was a scientist that was on the National Academy of Science with, uh, with Borlaug. And, um, and he asked Norm to advise him on this research project he was doing uh, in down in my neck of the woods here in Arizona uh, to this jojoba plant that had an oil to it that they could maybe use as a heating source. And this is back you know, in the 70s or so when he's working with him. And, uh, and Noel sat down with uh, Norm, they were waiting for their flights to take off and Noel, um, um, listen to some of the stories that that Borlaug was telling him and he couldn't believe some of these things of the the adventures that that Norman had in Mexico and and uh eventually and Nor and Noel wrote as a, a way of just making extra money for his family and um and he asked if he would be his could be his biographer and that started their relationship that was uh there for 25 years or longer. And they, when, when uh, Norm would make a trip to Washington, DC, you know, maybe for the National Academy of Science uh, meeting of some sort, then they would get together and he'd sit down and Noel would have his uh, little um, cassette recorder and he would record Norman telling these stories. And uh, so that's what's uh, in these books. There's like about 300 different stories that that Norm told to, to uh, uh, Noel, and then Noel transcribed them, listening to those old cassette tapes. And, and so you'll see there's different font size for that. And it, it has like Norm will then tell a story about his one room school experience and uh, the day that he almost died and, uh, you know, in the snowstorm. So those are, they're pe peppered throughout this, uh, this book and it's, uh, it really does uh, give you a personal uh, look at, at Borlaug's life on the farm and, and also in Mexico and around the world. Uh, 
one thing I just mentioned, we are planning to get Neil um, uh, to speak to us also. He spoke to the Lodge about oh, 12 years ago, and we're hoping to get him again, especially when we're actually going to have in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. and it's a very good series. I recommend it highly. Yes. Our, our reading, our Lodge reading circle read, um, I think it was all three volumes. I'm not sure. Hmm. Many years ago. And no, I don't remember who recommended it, but no one else in the reading circle had ever heard of Norman Borlaug. And it was like a really eye-opening reading experience. So. No, it's just, it's, it's, he's that, you ask uh, somebody, you know, like in Iowa, who is, you know, who Norman Borlaug is, they might say, yeah, I've heard of him, but they, they really don't. It, it's just like a, a person that uh, went about his work without any kind of fanfare and yeah. um, look what he did in one lifetime. He's, he's credited with saving hundreds of millions of lives, especially those third world country um, people that didn't have a chance. And it's just from sheer hard work that he was able to get that done. And then his determination to convince others that this is what uh, they need to do, you know, so that they can grow more food. Uh one thing I notice in his life is how things seem to work together. Um, he got the uh, problem of solving uh, the wheat rust uh, simply because he was a junior member of the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was the junior member of the team. And that's a project no one else wanted because you're looking at someone hands you a problem that is a a 2000 year old problem that's pretty daunting you know right yeah when you think of that uh he was able to eradicate that for 50 years that it's you know and uh stakeman his professor that he uh went to listen speak and then he decided to go into plant pathology said this is this is fungus is a shifty uh fungus that's going to come back you know and sure enough he, he was right but um yeah, he wasn't going to sit idly by, that's for sure. He worked so hard. He was not a scientist that worked in the laboratory. He was a scientist that was right out there uh, working with those scientists side by side. And that's what really, I think, impressed all the, uh, the farmers and the scientists from Mexico when they saw him out there. Because at first, they couldn't, he couldn't get anybody to come to, his, uh, to show his plots. Uh, and and uh, finally, he offered... Uh, at the uh, um, to show the, the the wheat that he had grown in the in the Yaki Valley, he offered beer, you know, <laughs> free beer, and then all of a sudden, yeah, you got some farmers that came by there, and then he was able to show them, you know, this is this is the seed, you know, um, but it took the tens of thousands of all the crossbreedings to come up with two varieties that were successful in uh, all those all the uh, characteristics that you want the short shorter plant bigger heads multiple heads disease resistant uh and would grow several times more um you know tons of grain so it's incredible mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, one of the things is that for a while he didn't have even not only did he have not in mexico he didn't have tractors for a while, he didn't even have horses. He had to plow it by plow the um, fields by hand. Yeah, that was up in the in the Yaki Valley, the one that's at sea level uh, up north. Uh, that it was a dilapidated research facility that um, had been abandoned. And so when he first went up there, he he didn't have any equipment. And uh, so yeah, there was an old cultivator there, and supposedly the one you know to get it. Um, there wasn't any equipment, there's no horses or whatever. So he strapped it to his uh, shoulders and pulled that, you know, by hand, you know, and he did this all by himself. He went up there all by himself. The Rockefeller Foundation did not want him going up there. They said, your job is here in Mexico City. He says, but I can get a whole nother growing season. And so what he did, he was, he was able to uh, accelerate that, uh, the crossbreeding programs by doing that, because then he had two seasons in one year instead of just the one season and it quickened it up and it still it took 
to perfect, to get those seeds. Uh, it was 15 years before they had the broad success, but um, it changed Mexico. You could see this town of Obregón, which is up in the, that uh, Yaqui Valley, that was just a little sleepy little town of you know a thousand people or so. And then after his uh, innovations and uh, him convincing the farmers uh, in the area that they all started growing his wheat, and all of a sudden this is a major uh, industrial city that is processing all the cereal grain that's coming through. Pretty incredible. Uh, also, uh, John um, uh, Lund is here, and he's uh, someone who also uh, worked with uh, Norm. Uh, John, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Norm for? Yeah, oh, first off, uh, it was a great presentation. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, I got to meet the Norm Borlaug when he was in his 90s. Uh, we were together at a conference in, in Norway offered by the uh, Norwegian company called Yara which used to be called Norsk Hydro. It's the world's largest uh, fertilizer company in the world. And um, they started a thing called the Africa Food Prize. Um, a lot of people don't realize uh, behind the scenes all the work that particularly the US government has done over the years to try to help um, uh, with, the, you know, with, with crises around the world. But Africa, the last, let's say, decades, uh, the US government has put a lot of money into health and and uh, <clears throat> child care and that type of thing. And the population is finally starting to grow again, but food production has been flat. Uh, so you've got a, a potential situation that, that uh, Dr. Borlaug really uh, uh, keyed in on. Uh, and in Norway, he was definitely a hero, if you would, and treated it with a, a great deal of respect. I mean, in, not too many people on this globe get the Nobel Peace Prize. So, but at the same time, he was, uh, brought in to, to, to initiate the first of these Africa food prizes. And um, he was introduced by Jeffrey Sachs, who, who's a very well-known uh, economist and considered the world's expert on sustainability. Uh, he was just praising Dr. Borlaug to no end that day. Um, so I actually got to meet him several times at breakfast. We were all staying at this hotel that had a fantastic uh, Scandinavian uh, Smorgasbord breakfast, and Dr. Borlaug liked his uh, his herring, as I remember. <laughs> 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 and uh, he was a good companion, and and uh, my wife was with me as well, and uh, extremely modest type of individual. Um, but when he walked into a room, he got attention, and and uh, um, there were people there from all around the world, and and he could get off a plane, they said, in in India, and go directly to the prime minister's office without having an appointment. So I think it's a little bit like what it says in the Bible, you know, no prophet is within honor in his own land. Outside of the U.S., this man was greatly honored. And, uh, but he started this fantastic initiative um, and, and the training and the stuff. So today there's 16 major research centers similar to the, to the, to the wheat one uh, that are chartered under the United Nations. Uh, so Rockefeller Ford Foundation, the U.S. government in particular, uh, the Nordic countries all have funded these research centers, which are around the world. Um, there's one on forestry, there's one on fisheries, there's one on, on rice. Um, and, and Dr. Borlaug has, has had his hands on, on all of that. His, his, his model, if you would, is, is, is the, the cornerstone of it all. Uh, it's, it's a big organization that's basically managed out of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. But a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. government um, we take our country has such a, an incredible infrastructure of education uh, and support for agriculture uh, that's been missing from the globe. So, you know, when when you talk about the situation in Mexico, that's that was not un, that unusual outside of the U.S. and 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 really Europe. So the the, found, the American foundations and now the Gates Foundation, um, they they've all played a major role getting behind this initiative. Uh, U.S. AID, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, most of the African, when I was in Africa, most of the African researchers had been educated in the U.S., you know, at the American land grant schools. Um, some of them were Borlaug scholars. That's a very big program run, I think, out of the USDA still, the, the Borlaug scholarship program, which trains a lot of people. But again, seeing him in, pres in person and, and, and he's a very modest man for sure, but uh, 
but the people around him didn't treat him that way, if you, if you understand. I mean, in, in, in Norway, he was a hero. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was just a very humble man, but he just, one of the things, you know, I had fourth grade kids and I was able to take them down. He was going to speak in New Hampton, which is just about 20 miles from his farm. And um, I asked my principal, could I take my kids down there to see him? And, and she agreed to that. So I took junior high kids down and then my fourth grade class. And he was speaking uh, at a fundraiser for our foundation, our Norman Borlaug Heritage Foundation, to help put a, the, the uh, wood shingled roof on, our, on the house. And uh, he got done speaking. He says, ladies and gentlemen, you have to excuse me for a few minutes. I have some young people to go talk to. And so he came over and shook all the kids' hands. And I had printed off some pictures of, of him and the wheat fields. And then he signed all their, you know, the, all their the signatures for them and shook their hands. And then he was always, uh, whenever he was around kids, and I saw this at the Youth Institute at, and the World Food Prize, he would shake, shake that kid's hand and then he'd give him a firm handshake. And he says, you shake my hand hard, you know, and then look me right in the eye. He says, that means you, you mean it. And then he'd be very interested in knowing, you know, what the kid's interest was. And, and uh, you know, he, that's, that's the, the, uh, the thing about Norman is he was comfortable with, uh, you know, children. He was comfortable with uh, the small stakes farmers that are in Africa and, uh, the scientists, the prime ministers and presidents, it didn't matter to him, you know, but uh, he really did love children just because he knew that, that these are the people that are inheriting the world. And so it's, it's gonna be up to them. So we're lucky enough to be able to have those inspired days at the farm site and, and give that little, uh, you know, so that all of, uh, at least the area kids that are in our area are all, they all know who Norman Borlaug is. And it's unfortunate as his years go after, you know, he died in 2009, that that memory is gonna fade somewhat. And, and uh, that's unfortunate, but, you know, he has left behind, just like uh, John had mentioned that there are those teams of scientists and, and research facilities that, uh, that he helped to find, uh, found, and and uh, it's just got to keep going, and hopefully we can get the population under control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but one thing about Borlaug, I mean, he was a very modest person, but he was uh, not afraid to uh, speak his mind. And if he felt someone was being thick-headed or being obstinate, he would share that with him in very strong terms. And he was afraid of no one. Right. He had a great sense of courage uh, of his convictions, but he had, he had no fear of uh, the rich or powerful. No, no beating. Hey, Tom, Tom, would you, uh, Tom, Tom, would you, you turn, turn uh, off your, your slide, slide project, uh, uh, presentation? Yes, I think I did. No, oh, you still have a little okay. bit. There. Here it is. And just do the stop share. But you had a little thing that says stop share. Okay. Stop. Okay. Okay. Good. But I, I was uh, struck with his life is that how much his uh, early education, I mean, early background as being you know, on a subsistence farm helped him relate to the farmers and agricultural people throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Well, he, you know, like when he went to uh, the one room schoolhouse, it was very unusual in those days uh, that any boy after he finished his eighth grade to go on to high school. I mean, boys in that day and day and age on the little rural farmscapes that everybody was living on, then they were expected to go back and help. You know, they did the, the manual work out there in the fields. And it was very unusual that here his cousin Sine, his teacher, went to his parents in that house and said, Norm needs to go to high school. As, a, as, an, as an academic, he's no great shakes, but he's got a lot of grit and determination. And they believed in education and uh -huh. they sent him there. You know, otherwise, you think about the, uh, the coincidences of what happened to him in his life. I mean, most boys would have stayed on the farm, but instead he went on to high school. And then from that, he, he took a class, uh, an ag class that uh, um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Schroeder, his ag teacher, that 
uh, first they had a little growing plot out in the high school in Cresco and, and he was introduced to fertilizers and how that just made that corn grow so much uh, better. And uh, then he was going to go be, he was going to be a teacher at uh, what is now the University of Northern Iowa. And he, and the guy from Cresco that was going to the University of Minnesota convinced him, no, come up there, you can play football. And it changed his whole direction. And he went into forestry and then that forestry job fell through. And then because of that, he went back to school and he gets his plant pathology. Otherwise, you know, his, the direction of his life would have been completely different and it wouldn't have done, uh, he might've done something tremendous in forestry or he might've done something tremendous as a, as a science teacher and a coach but uh, all of those little uh, uh, changes and uh, happenings in his life changed the direction of the world. Mm -hmm. When you think about, uh, you know, all the seeds, the, the wheat seeds that were planted, uh, you know, after his successes, all the wheat that was grown in the world, all the, the bread that we're eating were all the descendant seeds from what Borlaug did, which is saying quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Be said, you could say that if you want to see his uh, legacy, you can just look on your kitchen table. Yeah, right. Yep. Uh, uh, and I, oh, one question was uh, put on the uh, chat window is, has any strand of wheat been named after Borland? Borland? I, I don't think so. Mm. I, they always had uh, the, the names were like the dwarf wheat was a Norin 10 uh -huh. um, way that where they got, I think it was from like regions and things like that, but I don't think they named anything after uh -huh. people or anything uh -huh. like that. It had but, to there's, do with but there's certainly enough, a uh, lot of things that are named after Borlaug. Right. Yeah. The uh, Norlog. building, the, there's the ag building in the, at the university of Minnesota is, um, and of course, we've got the statue now in Statuary Hall, but uh, there's a, there's a uh, elementary school in Iowa City, Iowa, that is Borlaug Elementary, but that they uh, left it to the kids to name. And so they researched, uh, you know, people that they think would be worthy of that. And they they researched Borlaug and, and uh, named it Norman Borlaug Elementary. But um, so anything that... Uh, that can keep that man's uh, legacy alive is, and that's what my job is at the foundation is to, you know, do the educating and speaking to people like your group. I've spoken to several Sons of Norway groups, uh, regional ones and local ones. Um, and, uh, you know, groups, small groups that come to the farms. Uh, uh, we have lots of school groups that come. So it's just, you know, it's one person at a time who, you know, that we tell this to the kids and we say, now it's up to you to, you know, don't waste your life. Have a purpose-filled life like Norman Borlaug did. Oh, that's quite a challenge. Uh, yeah, great is. presentation. I really want to thank you. Um, and I just want to make sure that no one has any other questions or comments or reminiscence. Um, yeah, I think that would be great that if you could get Noel Wiedmeyer to come and. No. Yep. Yeah, we <laughs> will get that too. And we can get him in, in person since he's local. So, but right. uh, you're welcome anytime you're in DC area to look us up and thank you. And uh, okay. uh, we'll hopefully be supporting and we'll be supporting your group in the future. So, all right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bill. thank you to all of you. Okay. Now,